Beruchim Abayim, ladies. We are studying today <coughs> two parashiyot again. Acharemot and Kedoshim. The parasha begins by the Be'er Hashem and Moshe. And God spoke to Moshe saying, Acharemot, after the death of Shene Bene Aharon, after his two sons had died, Aharon's sons, as we learned, they died tragically uh, on the day of the dedication of the Mishkan. They went into the Holy of Holies and they made different sins according to different opinions, but everybody agrees that they died on that day. So God tells Moshe, go tell Aharon that Tell Aharon that he has to be careful that he's not allowed to go into the Holy of Holies uh, frequently. As a matter of fact, he's only allowed to go into the Holy of Holies one day a year. The Holy of Holies was like the inner chamber in the Beit HaMikdash. There were different rooms in the Beit HaMikdash. And all the way in the inner sanctum, you had the Aron, which was the ark that had the tablets in it. And on that you had the Kirubim which were like, in English they call them cherubs, which were like two faces of children that were looking at each other, and God rested in between the kirubim. That was the holiest place in the world. It's still today the holiest place in the world. Today if you go to Israel, and you take a tour under the Kotel, you could walk at the excavations underneath, they, uh, they dug it out. They could take you to the spot, which is the closest spot that Jews are allowed to go, and you'll be right uh, facing the Kodesh Kodashim. It's probably the most opportune place in the world to pray, because you're praying right in front of the Holy of Holies, but you're just on the other side of it. So, God tells Aaron, or Moshe tells Aaron in the name of God, be careful, you remember what happened to your two sons when they went into the Holy of Holies, be careful, don't make that mistake. Because remember, they died. So that she tells us very interesting over here. He gives a mashal. He says, imagine there was a sick person that came to a doctor. And the doctor tells him, I don't want you to eat this type of food. And I don't want you to drink this type of drink. And I don't want you to sleep in this type of bed. And then another doctor comes along and says... I don't want you to eat this type of food or drink this type of drink or sleep in this type of bed because if you don't listen to me, you're going to die like that person did. Now, which doctor's advice is more heated? Which means the person, the patient, who's going to listen to more? Of course, the second doctor that already gave an example. He didn't just say, don't eat this, don't drink this. He said, because if you eat this, you're going to die like Mr. So-and-so. So, now he put it, he brought it to the table. Now already he gave him a, a proof of the damage that can happen if he doesn't listen. It seems it's the same thing that happened here. God doesn't tell Aaron, don't go into the Holy of Holies. That wasn't sufficient. He says, don't go into the Holy of Holies because you remember what happened when uh, your children went to the Holy of Holies. They died. And therefore, if you do that, the same thing could happen to you. From here we learn a very important lesson. That verbal uh, admonition is not enough. It's not enough when we rebuke, we rebuke our children, for example, just to tell them, don't do this. You're not allowed to do this. Or we don't do this. A child... Or well, even in the case of Aaron, it was a Sadiq, they can't understand that, it's words. They want to do what they want to do. You have to bring it to reality. You have to say, if you do this, for example, tell a child, if you're going to get involved yourself in such a lifestyle of drugs, you're going to go to jail like so-and-so went to jail. One parent took his son, before he was on drugs, took his son to a prison. I took a tour of a prison and said, see that boy, he's in jail, look at him, look what they're doing to him. Because he... So then when the child sometimes sees uh, an example, when it's brought down to reality, then already the musar, then already the rebuke, it registers. Aaron, it wasn't enough to tell him, don't go into the holies. 
He said, don't go in the old Look what happened to your children. They died because of that. Even Aharon needed a strong uh, proof or a reality in order to impress upon him the seriousness of what he was not allowed to do. It's like that in life. You know, we can know things intellectually, but it doesn't mean we follow it. There's a big distance between the brain and the heart. One rabbi said the distance between the brain and the heart is like telling Reuven not to do something and expecting Shimon to listen. It's two different people. <laughs> if you tell Reuven not to do something, it doesn't affect Shimon. Telling the brain not to do something has no effect on the heart. Many people know the dangers of smoking. There are doctors that wrote papers on the dangers of smoking. But you see them in front of their office buildings in Manhattan, outside like lepers, standing out there smoking cigarettes. You say, doctor, but you, you, you know better than everybody. <laughs> he knows it. But uh, it doesn't register yet to the heart. And therefore, in religion, it's not enough to know things. You have to try to bring it to, to a reality so you can sense it, so you can feel it. You have to make it real, that it's not just, it's not just words. Unfortunately today, this is just a side point, this example that I gave with drugs is not a good example. Because they did studies today that even if you tell your children that you're going to die if you take drugs, and uh, it's going to affect you when you're going to get hurt and damaged, and you point, look at this one, look at that one, today they're finding out that it doesn't work either. It's amazing such a... Uh, an addiction that we have today, such a, 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 um, a drive to take these things that nothing works. In the olden days, if you showed a person a prison cell or somebody that died or somebody got sick, that was enough. Or we don't want to get involved. But it seems that the pleasure to do this is so great that really nothing can help. Maybe, maybe what uh, the experts say is... When a child at a young age sees in his parents that pleasure is not everything in life, that everything in life is not about satisfying pleasures, when the child sees that the parents sacrifice for religion, when they do things not necessarily out of convenience because they have to, they're not always traveling and not everything is about leisure and life is not always about a party and where you're going to revel and where you're going to celebrate, then maybe the child will have strong values that he'll know life is not about just uh, taking something to get high because he learned from his parents who were grounded people. But when our children see parents that are treating life as a big party, that they're running from one pleasure to another pleasure, from one feast to another feast, from one vacation to another, from one gadget to another, from one uh, desire to another. So what do you expect the child to do? He does, to him, they give him this. This you'll feel good if you take it. Okay, this is his pleasure. And therefore, parents must model decent behavior to their children if they expect them to have a chance at not getting involved in the uh, addictions of society. I saw an idea brought down in one of the books. It says, the Kohen Gadol was to be alone in the Holy of Holies on Kippur. Nobody was allowed to be with him. The Gemara says not even the angels would enter the Holy of Holies with the Kohen Gadol on Kippur. We believe that there are always angels that are escorting a person. Certainly the Kohen Gadol has angels around them, even though you can't see them, but they're there. But when he entered the Kodesh Kodeshim, he was alone. There's another place in the Torah where you see somebody that was alone. It was Moshe Rabbeinu when he gave the Torah. It says all the Jews had to stand back, and only Moshe was able to go up to God, and he came down with the Torah. So I saw from... One of the rabbis, he said, isolation from society is not usually advantageous. Our Torah does not preach to isolate yourself from society. We're supposed to be with our families. We're supposed to interact with people. We're supposed to enjoy our community. We're supposed to be social. We're supposed to have friends. However... 
the rabbi says that the lesson of Aharon going into the Holy of Holies once a year is to tell us that specific times a year, isolation, as the rabbis call it in Hebrew, hitbodedut, is good. To be alone, away from people, where you have a chance to meditate, where you have a chance to be in solitude, where you're able to think, and you're able to get your life in order with God, at those moments when you're alone, you're supposed to think to yourself, imagine I was alone in the world, just me and God. How religious would I be? Most of us would be very religious. If it was just us and God, and nobody else, we would have no pressure. We would have no... Nobody to impress, or nobody to appease, or nobody to imitate. We wouldn't have to adopt other people's values. Most people, unfortunately, have a difficulty in getting close to God because they're worried, what are people going to say? A lady wants to become modest, but she has inhibitions. How are they going to react? What are they going to talk about me? What are my best friends going to say? You got brainwashed, you became... uh, you became a uh, black cat, and uh, what does your husband say, and what does that one say? But imagine if that lady was alone in this world. Her and God. She would probably be dressed like a lady from Williamsburg. Who's going to open their mouth? She's impressing God, God is happy, and she's happy. Unfortunately, society, as good as it is, as important it is to be with people, sometimes it's people that limit us from reaching our potential. Therefore, the Torah is telling us, Aharon would be in solitary confinement, in isolation, once a year, which means it's not the rule. But from time to time, it's good to take hold of yourself and pull away from people and think to yourself, am I living my life according to the way I'm supposed to act? Or am I living my life to impress other people? At the end of the day... One should live his life the way he feels or she feels they're supposed to live. Because everybody has to do what they have to do. At the end of the day, the person that's criticizing you really doesn't care what you do between me and you. For them, it's conversation. Oh, you're doing this, you're doing that. Then they walk away, they figure they go out for lunch. You think they're thinking about you all day long? They're not thinking about you all day long. But we get possessed by it. Oh, what are they going to say? What are they saying? What are they they don't care about you. Don't, you're not so special that people are thinking about you all day long. They have their own problems. But in our brain, oh, they, they, they think, they're talking, no one's talking, no one thinks. It's the two-second uh, conversation and next. And therefore, it's good to meditate once in a while, to put yourself alone with you and God, and think of these hard questions. How would you act if you're alone? And then maybe when you go out to the people, it'll give you strength and confidence to do what you're supposed to do, not what people expect you to do or want you to do. There's a interesting service that was done on Yom Kippur. It's mentioned in this week's Perasha. It's actually a speech that I make every year on Kippur. Although I try not to repeat myself, but such, a, such an idea is a very, very uh, powerful lesson. I'll review the ceremony with you. There was two goats... In Hebrew, they called them se'irim. Two goats that they would bring on Yom Kippur as a korban. One was a traditional sacrifice where you slaughter it and you put it on the altar and you burn it, you take the blood and you sprinkle it wherever you have to sprinkle it. The other one was called the goat ta'azazel. Very, very strange practice. They would take a goat, which was very similar to the other goat. The Gemara says they have to be identical, the two goats, in value, in size, in look, in appearance. And the Kohen, whoever would take the goat outside the Beit HaMikdash and walk it up a tall mountain overlooking Jerusalem. The mountain was called Azazel. And then the Kohen would stand behind the animal and he'd push it off the mountain. Now, although it doesn't sound Torah-like such a practice to throw an animal off a mountain, but the Torah says that when the animal would start rolling down the mountain, you can imagine what happens to such an animal, it would serve as a kapara for all the sins of Israel. As a matter of fact, they used to tie a red string to the horn of this animal, and they would 
entire red string on the wall of the Beit HaMikdash. And they noticed that once the animal fell down the mountain, the red string would turn white. It's a miracle to show that the sins of the Jews are falling down the mountain with the goat. It was a practice. So Rav Samson Rafal Hirsch, in a classic commentary, says the following. Imagine if the goats were able to talk. Or even if we were able to hear what the goats were thinking. Here you have two goats standing in the Beit HaMikdash. And the Kohen would come with a lottery. And there were two tickets in the lottery. One said, La Hashem, for the Mizbeach, and one said, for Azazel. And he'd mix it up, and he'd pick with his right hand one, and his left hand the other, and he'd put on one of the goats, this is for the Korban, and this is for Azazel. And both of them don't know really what that means yet, so they're waiting to see what they're going to do. So it says, first they would bring the animal on the Mizbeach, and the Azazel Korban's watching. Hazit, my friend, look what they're doing to him, the poor guy. They're slaughtering the guy, they're stripping his skin, they're burning him, look what they're doing to his blood. Surely the goat of Azazel would say, it looks like I won this lottery. In every lottery, there's a winner, there's a loser. He says, this guy got the raw end of the deal. Poor thing. Burnt on the Mizbeah without any compassion. Then the Kohen comes to the Sa'ila Azazel and starts to walk it. And there's an entourage. And they start walking the Sa'ila of Azazel outside the Beit HaMikdash. And he's thinking to himself, the animal, look how lucky I am. Look at this, look at the honor they're giving me. On Yom Kippur Day, when everybody's in synagogue crammed praying, I get to take a walk in Jerusalem to smell the fresh air. When all the hachamim are surrounding me. Look at the honor that I'm getting. And he thinks he says, Miskeen, the poor guy, my poor friend, Hazit, he's ashes now. He's smoke. And they're walking him in the street. Everybody's looking, everybody's pointing. And he's feeling proud. And now they start walking him up a mountain. He says, wow, look at this. The scenic route they're giving me. The top of the mountain, I can see Jerusalem in all its glory. You can see the Beit HaMikdash from the top of Azazel. And again he says to himself, how lucky I am. What a miskeen my friend is. What a sacrifice he did. And all of a sudden, in one second, all his friends that were standing there turn around. And it hits them all of a sudden, what's going to happen? And they turn from behind and they start to push him. And at that one split second, right before death, he realizes that indeed he's the one that lost this lottery over. Look at them, they're throwing him off a mountain. It was a setup. He thought that he had the life. But at the last moment, he realized that at the end, he has nothing. At least that other animal went up to God on a Mizbeach might have been a sacrifice, it might have been painful, but at the end of the day, that animal's with God. Where am I going to end up being thrown off a mountain in the middle of the wilderness? But it's too late. It says Rav Samson Rafael Hirsch, these two goats represent two lifestyles. The lifestyle of the religious people and the lifestyle of the secular people. The religious people have to sacrifice, no question. They can't go to every restaurant, they can't work on Shabbat. They can't work on holidays. They're limited in how they have to dress. They're limited in what they're allowed to speak. They're only allowed, uh, they must be in synagogue. They must do mitzvot. They must send their kids to yeshiva. Tens of restrictions of a lifestyle to the religious man. But to the secular Jew, he can do whatever he wants. He can wake up when he wants, go to sleep when he wants, come when he wants, go when he wants, say what he wants, act like what he wants. So the secular Jew thinks to himself, huh, who won the lottery of life? Look, look at my lifestyle, enjoying, carefree, do what I want. And look at the Hazit, the religious guy. The poor religious lady, 90 degrees in the summer, and she's dressed, covering sleeves, covering this, covering that, boiling. I look at me, I can walk like I want. I'm the free one. I'm the good one. 
Look at me. I wake up 10 o'clock in the morning. And look at my friend. He has to wake up 6 o'clock to go to a class and then to pray and then to have another class. Where is he? Look at my friends, they're limited, they, they go away, they have to bring food with them, and they have to put it in the hotel room and bring it down, double wrap, triple wrap, I go like a king. No coolers, no problems, I eat like a melech when I want, I drink any wine that I want. Look at them, they have to bring their own wine, make sure nobody touches it, all these crazy... Poor thing to have this lifestyle. But he says at the end of the day, this person gets a little older in life, like the goat... He starts to realize that at the end of the day, his lifestyle brought him nowhere. His life, he's still not happy. He still has no satisfaction. He's still searching. His kids, unfortunately, are lost because of this lifestyle that he had. And then he says, you know what? Maybe all that sacrifice of religion was worth it. Because at the end of the day, where am I going to end up? And where he's going to end up with all his sacrifice, he's going to be with God for the next eternity. And where am I going to be for the next eternity? But unfortunately, people wake up like the goat too late. When already they're at the verge of death, they're about to be pushed off the mat, and they say, oh, we made a mistake. Fortunate, Rabbi Hirsch says, is a person that realizes their mistaken lifestyle when they still have the ability to change a lifestyle. You shouldn't wait. God's first person on his deathbed says, oh, they were right, I was wrong. Now what? Could you change it? And therefore, we don't argue. Religion definitely has restrictions and definitely has things that are difficult. But at the end of the day, it leads to a better place. It leads to, to bliss. It leads to eternity. It leads to happiness. And between me and you ladies, after a while, the religion starts to be sweet. And then you can't imagine of not doing the mitzvah. I can't imagine not being in the synagogue at 6 o'clock in the morning delivering a class. If God forbid I should wake up late one day, if I wake up at 7 o'clock in the morning, already I feel like my whole day was ruined. I missed the shiur. And, while other people are still twisting and turning, and they're enjoying the comfort of the bed, but a person that gets used to the religion, it becomes an addiction. It becomes a labor of love. Imagine if they took away Shabbat from us. What would we do? Imagine they took away our holidays. And even kashrut, it tempers our pleasure, it tempers our hedonistic desires and drives. Eventually it becomes easy. But even at the time that it feels like the sacrifice, there's a purpose. It leads to something good. The lifestyle is a payment. I always tell my children when I sit down with them, it goes back to the first thing, which is also what I'm saying. You have to make the religion a reality. I want them to do something, to bring me, let's say, a glass of water. Who wants a million dollars? million dollars? What million dollars? Wow. I want a million dollars. Million. But a million, not less, maybe more, but at least a million dollars. What do you mean, Daddy? Whoever brings Daddy a glass of water will fulfill a mitzvah of kibbud abba'im. God says that there's reward for kibbud abba'im, minimum a million dollars. The second you bring me the water, they're going to put in your bank account forever a million. What can I do with the money? Anything. And Shammai would do anything with the money. But what did you do to your children? You explained to them that these things are reality. These things are not just uh, something in the air. These things are, these are something real. But it's uncomfortable. I have to get up now. And I got to go bring it. And co- but look, look what you're going to get. There's a payback to it. And the other child that sits back and he thinks, look, he has to go and he's, he has to bring it and do it. I'm relaxing, sitting on the couch. Comes a time when that child realizes, look, my brother was the lucky one. Because at the end of the day, he's, he sacrificed, but God rewards. And me, I took all my reward in this world. And you know what? I didn't even have this world. One time, they asked the great Gaon Rav Shach, What's the difference between those that are observant and those that are not observant? Isn't it obvious? So Rav Shach said a very sharp answer. He said, those that are observant have two worlds. The world to come, and they benefit from this world also. Those that are not observant don't benefit from either world which is something we might not have said. We might have looked at it the other way. We might say, listen, the difference between a secular Jew and a religious Jew, we have Olam Abba, 
And they have Olam Azeh. They enjoy this world, we enjoy the next world. Rav Shach said, no. In truth, it's the religious Jew that enjoys both worlds. It's the secular Jew that doesn't enjoy this world. And you think about it. Judaism in the religious way, where a person gets to spend time with his family on a Shabbat, where a father sits with his children and studies Torah with them on a daily basis. The synagogue life. The Jewish life, family purity life, all these laws make this world pleasurable, make this world enjoyable. Those people that think they're living a secular life and they're enjoying this world, they're fooling themselves. They're looking for happiness and they can't find it. And therefore Rav Shach said, religious people benefit not only there, but they're benefiting here. Religion leads to happiness. And therefore the rabbi is telling us over here, remember the story of the two goats. You might think you're the winner, but at the end of the day, such a life is filled with remorse and regret. There's a pasuk also in Parasha, in Perek Yud Het. It says like this: By the Ber Hashem and Moshe Lemor, the Ber Bnei Yisrael Amarta Elohim, speak to the Jewish people. And tell them, I am your God. I don't want you to follow the practices of the nations of Canaan. The Jews were entering the land of Israel. There was Canaani people that were living there. They were abominable people. They had all disgusting practices. God warns, don't learn from them. Then he continues. I want you to keep my mishpatim. I want you to keep my hukim. I am your God. What is a mishpat and what is a hok? A mishpat is a law that makes logical sense, that you can understand. Don't steal. That's logical. That's a mishpat. A hok is a type of law that's beyond human comprehension. Sha'atnez. Kashrut. We keep these laws even though we don't understand them. The Torah is telling you over here that even the logical laws, even the mishpatim, the reason why you have to keep them is because any Hashem, because I am God. Because once you start to use human logic, then already human logic changes from one generation to the other generation. If you're going to start to say, you know what, this makes sense, I'll do it. Maybe in another generation, it'll stop making sense to you. And then what, you're not going to do it? So even though, let's say, I'll give you an example, abortion. For many years in this country, abortion was, uh, was considered what it is, murder. It was a, an abominable practice. And it was not acceptable. And then all of a sudden, another generation, the same logical minds and the same ethical people, made it the law of the land, made every taxpayer pay for abortion clinics, and march on Fifth Avenue, saying that it's the right of a lady to choose. Pro-life. What happened? How can in one generation you say it's the worst avon in the world, and then another generation you say it's the best, the, the, the biggest mitzvah? So I'll explain to you how it happened. It's interesting to know this. Many years ago, in the early 1900s, the life expectancy of humans was very short. 40 years old, 50 years old. Infant mortality, God forbid, was very high. And there was no technology that replaced human beings. So human beings in the early 1900s were a commodity. You needed human beings. You needed population. You needed people to do work. You needed people because people were dying young and there was a lot of work to be done. You needed soldiers in the army. So therefore, abortion was counterproductive to them. And therefore, they said, no, human beings are a commodity. We need human beings. Abortions are sued. Now that people are living well into their 80s, into their 90s, and now that Baruch Hashem, infant mortality is being reduced drastically. There's no more tuberculosis hospitals in the country. So now already there's overpopulation. 
now that we have computers taking the jobs of men, so now what are we going to do with all these people? There's nowhere to live. <laughs> Look at all the traffic. So what happens? So now society comes along and says, you know what? No longer is a human being a commodity. Abortion's legal. Now you can kill baby. Now we don't need them anymore. We needed them. That's what happens when you start letting human beings decide right from wrong. When you start letting human beings going after their logic, in one generation they won't murder, and the next generation they'll legalize murder. Human beings cannot tamper with morality. Look what's going on in our country. Because human beings start, started to tamper with lifestyles. Today that they want to say this lifestyle is okay, you can live with this and that. They're killing the country with AIDS. Look what happened before these people got involved with all their morality and rights. Everybody was fine. Now because they're passing laws on all sorts of marriages and etc. Look how many millions of people have died as a result of it. And look how many more millions have contracted diseases that is going to bring to their death. This is what happens when human beings start to tinker with morality, then already they destroy the world. And therefore the Torah is telling you, keep my laws, not because you understand them, because I am God. Don't steal because I am God. Because once you start putting a reason to don't steal, you can come and give a reason to steal. You'll say, I don't steal because it's not right. Yeah, but let's say... I want to steal from somebody to give it to the rich, to give it to the poor, I'm sorry. They say, who would say that? Only Robin Hood. No. The communi- communists said that. Communism said that. That take from the rich and give to the poor. That's socialism. So you see, they came along and redefined don't steal. And they legalized stealing. But they said, no, this is not stealing. This is okay. Look what happens. And look what happened to communism. So the Torah tells you, you have to keep the laws because I said so. Even the logical ones, Mishpatim, because any Hashem. Honor your parents. Now, honor your parents is because God said so. Now, if you start saying, yeah, because you're honoring your parents because of a reason, then human beings can justify Has Shalom cremating their parents. Fellow will say, listen, that's the honor. I'm going to put them on my mantelpiece. I can look at them every day. I can see them every day. They're next to me. Which means once you start letting human beings decide right and wrong, they can burn their parents in the name of morality, in the name of compassion, in the name of respect. And then what Torah says, even if you think you understand it, put your ideas on the side and just do it because any has shame and you have to follow it as well. The second parasha that we read, parashat Kedoshim. The Torah says that this parasha was set in front of the entire Jewish nation. Rashi says, why was this set in front of everybody? Three million people had to congregate to hear this parasha. Rashi says... Because the most important laws of our Torah are written in Parashat Kedoshim. And therefore, everybody has to hear this parasha, without exception. What are some of the laws in that parasha? Respect for parents. Providing for the poor. Avoiding theft. The sin of lying. The sin of taking false oaths, paying workers on time, the sin of giving bad advice, the sin of revenge, the sin of harboring resentment, the mitzvah of giving benefit of the doubt. All the laws written in this perasha are all interpersonal mitzvot. Ben Adam lachavero. They have to do with man to man. It's quite interesting. This, according to the she, is the meat of the Torah. The laws that affect man to man. Unfortunately, many people give a importance, which they should, to the rituals of our Torah. 
which they have to. The mitzvah of tefillin, the mitzvah of praying, the mitzvah of kashrut, as we said, all those laws they give very strictness to, but at the expense of the laws between man to man. It's quite possible that we see very pious, they think they're pious, people that are involved in all the halachot and all the laws. Kiryat Shema at the proper time, Kavanan the Amida, according to all the opinions. However, when it comes to man to man, they cheat and they lie and they deceive. They might not pay their workers, they might speak Lashonara. They might not give the benefit of the doubt. Ruthless people. And I say very clearly, these people are not religious Jews. Yes, ladies, it's possible to wear tefillin and eat klat bet Yosef and eat kemak yashan and drink alav Yisrael and be considered a secular Jew. Because if you do not follow with the same stringency the laws of Parashat Kedoshim, of man to man, you're not considered religious. Our religion is made of two parts. Now, I agree. If you just keep the man to man and you don't keep the rituals, you're also not religious. Although many people, uh, they like to point fingers, oh, they don't keep the man to man. But relax, you probably don't keep the man to God. So there's, there's a balance there. We're not pointing fingers who keeps what. We're talking to ourselves. That to be considered a complete Jew, you cannot deny these mitzvot. These are also important and just as important. Tefillin and Lashon are the same. Kashrut and lying is the same. If you lie, you're not religious. If you talk Lashon Ara, you're not religious. But what do you mean? I'm modest. You're keeping one law, but you're in contempt of ten other laws. We're not allowed to tilt our religiosity to the man to God at the expense of man to man. It has to be equal. It has to be the same level. One of the laws is if your parents tell, if a parent tells a child to do something, the child must be obedient and listen. But what if the parent tells the child to do something against the Torah. So you know this law. It's written in this week's Penashah. The child does not have to listen. The father says, Son, I want you to come down to the store with me on Shabbat. I need you to work. I need a salesman. I'm tired. I'm getting old. I can't pay a salesman. You have to go to work. I'm commanding you. And his mother comes in the room and confirms it. Yes, your father's right. Go to work. The Torah says the child does not have to listen. However, I want to point out, only because this is a phenomenon that is taking place in our community, thank God, that many children that are fortunate to get a yeshiva education are coming home and are more religious than their parents. And they're bringing home values and mitzvot that may be different to the upbringing that they have. And of course the children learn in yeshiva. If your father tells you to mehalil Shabbat, you know, son, do me a favor, pass me the remote control on Shabbat. That I can't do that. But you have to remember that it does not allow the child to be disrespectful. Under all circumstances, even in the name of religion, the child must keep... Kibbut Avayim still applies. You're allowed to... Not listen, but respectfully. The Gemara says, you're supposed to tell your father, but daddy, uh, doesn't the Torah say otherwise? Meaning in a nice way. Not, you don't know what you're talking about. You never learned. I'm better. You don't know. It's forbidden. My rabbi said, he said I shouldn't listen to you. That the son is never allowed. Although the parent sometimes can be an annoyance to such a child, and the parent disrespects the child because of his values, but it doesn't say anywhere that a parent has to respect the child. Although it's proper practice for a parent to respect the child, but the child always has to respect the parent. See, a lot of times the parent gets offended. You're rejecting our way? Well, we're wrong. 
We've been doing this for so many years. You're going to come and tell us we're wrong. So it's, it gets personal. So it's uncomfortable for the parent. But in all cases, if you check these families, the grandparents were probably religious. And these parents did the same thing their children are doing to them. They rejected the religion of their parents. And now their children are going back to religion, rejecting the secular lifestyle. So what they did to their parents usually ends up happening to them anyway. It's just the reverse. They rejected religion and the children are rejecting the other way. In any event, that's not for a son to tell his father that. That's not for a daughter to start rebuking his mother how they did the same thing to their parents and they know better. So although the law says you don't have to be obedient, but respect always has to remain. And maybe that's one way the parent can accept the child's values. When the parent sees, look at the Torah. He doesn't say a bad word. He doesn't scream. Even though I'm doing something that he's not happy about, he keeps his composure. The child, If this is what Torah is, it's good. It's not so bad. It's when a child loses his school, then already he commits avon. And now he probably ruined it for the parent to try to come back. Last but not least, Torah says you have to pay your workers on time. I want you to know that even though you might not be businesswoman, where you have employees working for you, but this law applies in many situations in life. Person's coming home from the airport and he's a taxi. Halakha says, and the taxi driver says, $30 please, and you pay the taxi? You fulfill the mitzvah from the Torah to pay a worker on time. Instead of telling the worker, could you come back? I don't have it, please. Or you go to a service, you go to a manicure. And they tell you you have to pay for the money. I don't know how much it costs, but whatever it is. When you pay for a service that's done for you on time, you fulfill the mitzvah from the Torah, and therefore it's worthy to think of that. The next time a, serv- a plumber comes to the house to fix a pipe, and they give you a bill, and you pay for them, on, you fulfill the mitzvah from the Torah. That's the million dollars that I'm talking about to my children. You just got credited to your account, a million what, Wait a minute, I did something that I had to do. But if you just think for a moment before you give the money, I'm doing this because I have to do it, but also because God told me that as Jews... We must be very moral. We must conduct ourselves very honestly. And we must pay somebody for their services. At that point, you now just elevated that mundane act into a mitzvah from the Torah. I'll be honest with you. Even if you didn't think of that, it's still a mitzvah. But when you think of it, it enhances the level. They once saw the Hafez Chaim late at night. Coming out of a caravan. And this... Students were looking at the window. They saw the great sage coming out of the caravan. And he paid the guy some money. And they see him dancing. And he's dancing and he's singing. What, what could have motivated and inspired the Hafez Haim at 2 o'clock in the morning in the middle of Radin to start dancing in the streets? So they asked the Rabbi, what happened? So I just fulfilled the mitzvah from the Torah. I paid the taxi driver his money. I fulfilled the mitzvah of the Yomot Iten Sicharo. So they tell a story of a rabbi called Rav Zushya. Rav Zushya was a man that was very poor. Uh, but he never complained. Uh, he would always say that Hashem knows what I need better than I know what I need. And must be Hashem knows that I need poverty. That's why he's giving it to me. He had a very good attitude about life. His wife had one dress. And she didn't complain, but after a while, she got a little embarrassed. The neighbors would always see her wearing the same dress. So she asked the husband, please, when you have extra money, could you maybe get me an extra dress just so I can switch off? He says, fine. So he saved money. Till he saved the money, he says, fine, I have the money, go to the tailor, tell the tailor to make a dress. Uh, The tailor says, fine, I'll be ready in a week. She comes back and she looks at the tail, he's all dejected. She says, what's the matter? He says, oh, nothing. My daughter is getting married and we don't have too much money. And she wanted a dress for the wedding. We don't even have money for a dress for the wedding. 
She came into my store yesterday and she saw me working on your dress and she said, oh, daddy, you're making me a dress for the wedding. Thank you. And then I had to tell, no, it's really not yours. It's, it's for customers, it's for Rav Zusha's wife. And she came out crying and I started to cry. So the Rebison says, what's the question? Keep the dress. Keep the dress, please. Oh, thank you, thank you. She leaves. She goes home. She tells her husband. Husband says, where's the dress? No, here's the story. He tells her, God bless you. You did the biggest mitzvah. You made a bride happy. This is a big zechut. You acted in the right way. But did you pay the tailor? She says, pay the tailor? Pay the tailor? For what pay the tailor? She says, when you hire the tailor to make your dress, you were expecting it for yourself. You owe him that money. What would be if you took the dress from the tailor and decided to give it to another bride? You wouldn't have to pay the tailor. So just because you're giving it back to the tailor, the tailor was expecting some money. He needs that money for the dress. And therefore, go back and pay him for his work. Now you get the... Re- this is the Torah. When you use Torah logic, you see the different level over here. Pay for the dress, now give it as a gift. Not keep it, he worked. He had to pay for the material. He had to pay for these things over here. So you gave it to him, but it still cost the money. The real charity is... It's yours, pay for the give and the give. And therefore you see over here how ethical one that follows the Torah and how proper one that follows these laws. How If people would only follow these laws, there'd be no machloket in the world. There'd be no, there'd be no fighting. There'd be no, there'd be no strife between people. One of the hakamim said, I'm, forgive me, I know I'm going, I'm going a little over, but one rabbi said on the... Pasuk. Lo tisna et achicha bil babecha. says, don't hate your brother. When it comes to friends, it says, ve'ahavta l're'acha. You should love your friend. So one rabbi asked, when it comes to your brother, it says, don't hate him. When it comes to a friend, it says, love him. So the rabbi says, I never understood this pasuk until a situation happened to me. Four brothers came into my office and they had a will in their hand, and they were discussing how to, to divide their father's estate, because it wasn't clear in the will. And they started off calm, and as the meeting progressed, it got more heated, and now they started to scream, you this, you, and then it became uh, wild, it became unruly, and they were screaming at each other, cursing each other, and then this was an, I hate you, and you're in this, and, I, and now all of a sudden, it turned into a, uh, a fiasco. And the rabbi says, now I understand it. Because when it comes to brothers that have to s- divide a, a uh, inheritance, this already could lead to hatred. And therefore, the rabbi says, listen, my brothers, we can't demand to love, but lo tisna, don't reach the level to hate. When it comes to friends, where there's usually no money that divides them, then already we could say, not only don't hate, but love. Unfortunately, it's money that separates, and they say the root of all evil, unfortunately, that's what separates and causes such hatred. If people would only follow the Torah, be honest, and do what it says, then already there'd be peace, there'd be shalom. Adonai yevarech et amor b'shalom. Amen.